on the sandwiches. The humble sandwich may be a simple culinary construct, but once you really get into the meat of the situation, you'll find it's not so cut and dry. Not dry. The history of sandwiches is a multi-decker enigma that begins and ends with the same deceptively simple question. So today, we'll be stacking bread, meat, and facts while we attempt to answer the age-old question, what is a sandwich? Before we get started, make sure to subscribe to Weird History Food, and let us know in the comments what other slice of food history you'd like to hear about. Now then, you down with BLT? Yeah, you know me. What exactly constitutes the sandwich is a hotly contested question. So let's start like a best man bombing his reception speech and resort to the dictionary. According to Merriam-Webster, a sandwich, when used as a noun, has two different definitions. The first definition is two or more slices of bread or a split roll having a filling between. The second is, and we are not making this up, quote, something resembling a sandwich. Guess Miriam and Webster were both off that day. Obviously, your PB&Js or ham and cheeses fall into the category of classic sandwiches. But what about burritos, tacos, or even hot dogs? Ask any two random people off the street and you'll receive two very different answers. Not a sandwich. Even the state of New York has officially weighed in on the matter, which we'll get to a little later. Wow, it's like New York is a character in this video. The point is, sandwiches have been a topic of debate for ages, maybe even since the dawn of their invention, though we don't know that last one for sure since we don't know when the first sandwich was assembled. What we do know, however, is who the first sandwich was named after. In 18th century England, there lived a British aristocrat named John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Though he had several stately positions over his lifetime, Montague was most known for his rakish ways and predilections for gambling. Allegedly, while in the middle of a particularly laborious gambling session, Montague was unwilling to stop and eat. I shall have to stop playing cards in order to eat. Hey, we get it. We've all been to Vegas. He demanded salted beef be brought to his table between two slices of bread Huzzah! so he could eat his meal without ever having to stop what he was doing. This bold flex left such a mark on those around him that they dubbed this composition of bread and meat a sandwich. To be fair, seeing someone bash a super grinder together for the first time would be unforgettable. Modern historians have some doubts about the validity of the Earl of Sandwich story, however. It's more likely that he was seen publicly eating his famous sandwiches in London high society while serving as a member of the House of Lords. To add another layer of confusion, the first known use of the word seemingly had nothing to do with the Earl of Sandwich at all. In 1762, English historian Edward Gibbon wrote in his diary about seeing men eat a bit of cold meat or a sandwich, but made no mention of Montague despite him being active around this time. So which came first, the sandwich or the Earl? In any case, before Londoners had a name for them, people were chowing down on similarly sliced dishes. Mentions of bread and meat or bread and cheese can be found in 16th and early 17th century plays like George Peel's The Old Wives' Tale and William Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor. During the Middle Ages, beggars and dogs were often fed meat on trenches, which were essentially flat, stale loaves of bread. Going back in time still, Rabbi Hillel the Elder, who lived during the first century BCE, combined lamb and bitter herbs between matzah to create a biblically supported sandwich. Meanwhile, Mediterranean cultures, ancient Greeks, and Romans were all known for their flatbreads and fillings. It's even been suggested that the Earl of Sandwich got his taste for his favorite snack while traveling through the Ottoman Empire. So while we may never know who invented the sandwich, we do know we'll always be grateful to them. And that's why we'd like to give you some time to silently reflect upon your favorite sandwich. Mm. Ours is the Monte Cristo from Bennigan's. Once sandwiches had a name, word of them spread like mayo, and they became known the world over as quick and easy meals you could eat on the go. Sandwich street vendors and dedicated sandwich bars popped up in places like England, Spain, and Holland throughout the 19th century. They became so pervasive that the term sandwich took on a secondary meaning to describe the act of bookending something between two other things, which must be what Merriam-Webster meant by something resembling a sandwich. Sorry we ever doubted you. By the early 20th century, once bread found its way onto virtually every American dinner table, the sandwich was cemented as a staple across class and cultural barriers. 
no longer just for the aristocratic upper crust, thank you. This brave new frontier brought forth an onslaught of new types of sandwiches outside the realm of simple salted meats. Both regional and more widespread sandwiches were finding their way into the hearts, minds, and mouths of discerning American foodies. The Toasted Club Sandwich, featuring two layers of bread, mayonnaise, bacon, tomato, and chicken or turkey, became an expected menu offering at Gentlemen's Clubs. The introduction of canned tuna turned tuna salad sandwiches from wartime rations into fashionable lunchtime indulgences. And the first known recipe for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich was unveiled in the Boston Cooking School magazine of Culinary Science and Domestic Economics in 1901. If only that magazine had a few more words in its title. Let's suppose that sometime when you're out shopping, you bring home a jar of Skippy peanut butter. The popular pairing of PB&J would become even more prolific once mass-manufactured peanut butter hit store shelves in the early 1920s. American companies pushed the product on children, making peanut butter and jelly the go-to meal for school lunches. By the end of the 1920s, po' boys had sprung out of New Orleans after two restaurateurs gave them out for free to striking streetcar drivers. The drivers, colloquially known as poor boys, liked the combination of fried potatoes, gravy, and roast beef on a French roll so much that it stuck around for a hundred years. Whoa, whoa. Today, hundreds of millions of sandwiches are prepared and sold in the United States every single month. That is, in large part, thanks to the fast food boom that began in the mid-20th century. Grinders, heroes, hoagies, subs, or whatever you call them in your regional dialect, originated in the 1960s. And fast food burger joints have been around even longer than that. But wait, do burgers count as sandwiches? Fluff or nutter? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Thanks to the flexible definition of the word, the sandwich category has only broadened over the years. In particular, the rules around what types of bread you can use to make a sandwich have loosened up significantly. We previously mentioned po' boys, which were served on split French rolls instead of traditional sliced bread. Submarine sandwiches followed a similar pattern, with artisans stuffing meats, cheeses, and veggies into long, cylindrical bread rolls. Other sandwiches use bagels as their bread of choice, while some people prefer English muffins. Then there's the panini, which is a grilled sandwich that typically uses a baguette, ciabatta, focaccia, or machetta. Stranger still is the open-faced sandwich, which ignores the concept of having two pieces of bread in favor of a single slice topped with whatever your sandwich loving heart desires. If all of these count as sandwiches, why not add hamburgers to the list too? They're just fillings between two slices of bread, aren't they? And while we're at it, what about all those other sandwich-adjacent foods we mentioned at the beginning of this video? Merriam-Webster's definition of two or more slices of bread or a split roll having a filling between seems to be a pretty straightforward answer on its face, or should we say open face? But as we've established, that definition only tells half the story. Because of the versatility of sandwiches, the range of fillings, and the wide variety of bread options, it's easy to argue for many, many things to be classified as a sandwich. Burritos are typically meat, cheese, and beans wrapped in a tortilla, which is a type of flatbread. Are they sandwiches? If so, tacos must also be considered sandwiches, since they tend to boast the same ingredients on a smaller scale. Following that same pattern, hot dogs certainly can't be left out of the equation. After all, a hot dog bun is nothing more than a split roll, which we then pack with fillings, like a tiny trencher at Ye Deli's of old. Depending on who you are, this might sound like perfect logic or complete madness. And what's really maddening is the fact that there is no definitive answer. Unless you live in New York. Told you we'd be coming back here. New York delis, bodegas, and restaurants are arguably the foremost authority on American sandwiches. But the state itself has the final say on the objective definition of a sandwich. And according to these Big Apple legislators, everything we've talked about today, from PB&Js to burritos, is classified as a sandwich. Why? Because of taxes. In New York, groceries are not taxable. These items include things like canned goods, meats, prepackaged foods, and vegetables. Other considerations include where the food is prepared, cooked, and eaten. So, anything prepared in-store is usually taxable. Under this law, sandwiches are not considered groceries and can therefore be taxed. But since the term sandwich is so loose, the state had to come down hard and fast to make the most of its sandwich tax law. As a consequence, all foods that even remotely resemble a sandwich are considered part of the club. And don't ask what the club is called, you already know. So what do you think? What's the weirdest sandwich you've ever made? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Weird History Food videos.